my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Ergo Baby. Founded in 2003, Ergo Baby has pioneered the gold standard for comfortable, ergonomic, soft, structured carriers. Their commitment to providing parents with the foundation to thrive has launched the company into creating a broad range of award-winning products that fit into families' daily lives seamlessly, comfortably, and safely, where function and quality are not compromised. In 2020, they launched Everlove by Ergo Baby, a first of its kind baby carrier buyback and resale program, a sustainability effort to support families and the planet. At the end of the episode, I talk with Shelby, a birth hour listener, about her experience using the new Ergo Baby bouncer, as well as her experience using some of their baby wearing carriers. As many of you know, and many have taken advantage of, we have a online childbirth course offered for birth hour listeners. It's called Know Your Options, and I partnered with a lactation counselor, doula, and childbirth educator to bring you an evidence-based, fully comprehensive course. When you sign up, you get lifetime access and instant access, so you can go at your own pace, but also join in on our bi-weekly Zoom calls if you want to connect and ask any questions. Along with that, you'll also get access to a private Facebook group where you can get to know other students students and ask our instructor and me anything that comes up for you while you're making your way through the course. As an added bonus, the course comes with a bonus course that's called Beyond the First Latch. This bonus course, which is also available individually for purchase, but comes for free with the Know Your Options course, covers all things pumping, nursing, feeding your baby, storing milk, all the things you need to know for getting baby fed. Over the past year, we've been working really hard to update this course and make sure everything is up to date as far as evidence-based information. We also added closed captioning to all of the modules, and we've made it inclusive for everyone to take. So find out more about this course at thebirthhour.com slash course, and we would love to have you join us. And if you're not currently in a stage where you need one of those two courses, but you still want to be part of a more close-knit birth hour community, you may be interested in joining our private Facebook group, which is a perk of being a Patreon member of the birth hour. If you don't know about Patreon, it's a way to support creators that you love by making a monthly contribution. We have different amounts starting from $1 up to $10, and you can see all of that information at patreon.com slash birth hour, and you'll see different ways to support and the different perks that come with those different levels. Today's guest, Britt, is actually a longtime Patreon member, and she gives such a great review of the Patreon group at the end of this episode during her resources. So be sure to listen to that, and you'll know what she's talking about and how to become a Patreon member by heading over to patreon.com slash birth hour. So yes, today's guest is Britt, and she's been on the podcast before. Back in 2020, she was on episode 470, which is now in our archives, which are another perk of being a Patreon member. You can access hundreds and hundreds of episodes via our archives. Um, But today she's back to share a postpartum story. So she talks a little bit about her second birth, but really her main focus is on just how different her postpartum experience was. Her first one was really all about navigating postpartum depression. And so with this birth, she really wanted to set up herself for success with postpartum by doing some things preventatively and making plans. So let's hear from Britt. Hi, Britt. Welcome back to the birth hour. Thanks for being here today. Hi, thank you so much, Brian. I'm so happy to be back on. Awesome. Well, yeah, you shared on episode 470 back in 2020, and now you're back to share your more recent birth story and also do focus on postpartum. So I'm excited to get to all of that. But will you just remind listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, my name is Britt. I live in upstate New York with my husband, Matt, and we have two daughters. Uh, Maya is four years old and Callie is two. I work part-time in public health, but I also am mostly staying home full-time with my kids. And my husband and I live in the Adirondacks, so we love living an active lifestyle. And it's been really great having kids and sharing in some of our activities together. So it's been great. All right. So let's hear a little bit about 
your birth, just as far as how you decided to go about planning for birth this time around versus your first birth? Yeah. So I shared a couple of years ago, which is wild that I was <laughs> pregnant at the time getting ready for this birth. And it's so funny to think back on that time. But my first birth experience, it was in a hospital, pretty straightforward. But I shared a lot afterwards about how I struggled a lot with postpartum depression. And I think the whole experience just totally blindsided me. And I can really think back on that time and I get like a pit in my stomach when I even think about just what a challenge that experience was going through that and just not having a lot of resources at the time. So planning for the second looked really different for us. But I will say too that the birth itself was just like this amazing experience that really opened my eyes up to this whole world of birth and postpartum. And I wanted to learn more. I wanted any story I could get my hands on. I think I listened to like, probably all 700 episodes that you've done. Love it. And it's funny. I look back and I'm like, I used to remember being with like a group of friends and inevitably somebody would start talking about like their birth experience. And before having kids, I would just be indifferent or tune them out. And then after that, I wanted to know everything. I went back to my mom and I was like, tell me all the details about my birth and my brother's like... It's just funny how it changes your perspective after having that experience. Yeah, definitely. So I definitely geeked out on some birth hour episodes and knew the next time around how much I wanted to do things differently. I knew I didn't want to go back to the same hospital. I knew I wanted to have a birth that was more something that I got to take charge of and then it got to be my own experience. One thing that was really hard in my first birth was like the pushing phase and having like directed pushing. I ended up pushing for like almost four hours, which was just such such a tough experience. And I'm always wondering if I was able to just be a little more active, not kind of tethered down to a bed um, on my back pushing. I was like, what would go differently? So this time around, I found a different place. And long before I was even thinking about the second pregnancy, I had found a place that I knew I wanted to deliver at where I live, there's not a ton of options, but I did find a place about an hour and 15 minutes away. It's a hospital, but attached to it, they have a birth center. And I remember just reading through their policy and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to fight for like the things that I want. They're just the normal things that occur at this place. And their philosophy was your birth, your way. It's a very family centered. They encourage you to be active when you're laboring. So they encourage you to move around. There's a birth tub. Um, It just looked like a really great fit. And then I found a group of midwives who deliver there. And even like probably six months before I was even thinking of getting pregnant, I remember calling the midwives office and just had a great conversation with them. And I was like, yes, this is exactly where I want to be. Like I just knew that was going to be a good fit. So I knew that was where I wanted to be. And then once we got pregnant, I felt just super prepared for the birth. But also this time around, I knew I had to take a more active approach in preparing for postpartum. I had this huge fear of like, what if I end up with postpartum depression again? How am I going to navigate that while having a two-year-old at home and a newborn and just thinking about like, how can I can't go through that again? So I spent a lot of time just like talking with my midwives about that. And my husband and I just had more plans in place to know how we can kind of stave that off. So at the end of my pregnancy, I started on Zoloft, which was huge for me um, in managing my postpartum depression. So we had a plan to start on Zoloft to try to maybe get ahead of it if it did kind of creep in. And then my husband and I really planned on what we wanted our postpartum to look like. And we felt really overwhelmed the first time with just having visitors. We wanted to have more privacy and time alone as a family to enjoy that, which is funny because I gave birth like in the beginning months of COVID. So we didn't have to make a lot of decisions about that. It kind of helped us in a way to have less people around. So it was a little more peaceful, quiet. But yeah, so I think I felt really prepared for the birth. I was excited about doing it again. But definitely the postpartum piece, as I felt more prepared, I also had a lot of trepidation, I think, going into it, thinking of the what ifs. Yeah, it sounds like you guys did just a ton of preparation. And yeah, I've heard that a lot about COVID, it being kind of a silver lining for a lot of people because the way (laughs) that we treat you know, postpartum families sometimes isn't necessarily in their best interest because everybody Mm -hmm. wants to see the baby and everything. And 
It's like, just drop a meal off on the front porch. And yep. <laughs> let, us, let us rest or whatever. So yes. I'm glad that that worked out for you guys. Yes, absolutely. And it was funny because I actually felt so much better after the second that I actually did miss having visitors. I was like, this is really unusual for me. I'm more of a introverted person, but it was funny, but I was still very glad to have some like peaceful, quiet times. Yeah. Okay. All right. So how did labor start for you? Labor started on a Friday afternoon. I was a little over 40 weeks, which was fine by me. I went past 41 with my first. So I was totally anticipating. I told myself my due date was actually like 41 weeks instead. So I was a little surprised when it happened. I was 40 weeks and four days. And it started just like my first. I had a bloody show and I started having contractions. And I thought, oh, it's going to go exactly like my first. Except... I just had these contractions all day. They weren't progressing and it was just really weird. It would kind of start and stop. So that night I went to sleep feeling a little frustrated, but by the middle of the night, labor really started again. And I thought, this is really it. I didn't want to waste a lot of time because my first birth went pretty quickly. And so we were an hour and 15 minutes away. So my husband and I just drove right into the hospital thinking it was going to go quickly again. And the minute we got into the hospital, we had to go in through triage and it was not ideal because we went in and there's all these bright lights and side conversations. So I was just completely out of like that labor zone and my labor completely stopped. So I decided to just go home. If labor was going to stop, I might as well get some sleep. So we went back home and I was able to get some sleep and the same thing happened in the afternoon. It started again. I started having these really strong contractions. I actually got nervous thinking, I don't know if we're even going to make it to the hospital because it was so intense and felt so real. I thought it was going to happen really quickly. I went to the hospital. We got about 45 minutes away and my husband looked at me and he was like, it stopped again, didn't it? And I was like, I don't even know what to do. It's been 24 hours. I'm exhausted. This is just stopping and going. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, maybe we should pull over and we can go for a walk. But I called my midwife and it was the midwife that I really, really liked. And she was on call. And as soon as I heard her voice, I just started sobbing. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. This has been a day. I'm exhausted. This actually just happened. And so I told her I was thinking about either going back home or going for a walk. But she said, you know, at this point, it's been over a day. You're exhausted. You have to, we have to find a way to either make this happen or you can come in and we can do some therapeutic rest. And so just hearing that gave me some relief. And she also said, she was like, I think, you know, having you come through triage is really hard. I think it's kind of messing with your mindset too. And so she said, when I came in, they would put me right in the the birth center so that they would kind of quickly get me through triage without having to stay there, which was really helpful. So we went in and on the way, I think I had to release some like really big emotions. I started just crying and I told my husband I was so scared that I was going to end up with postpartum depression again. And I think that was holding me back, my fear of having this happen again. I was also really nervous about having my toddler at home and it had just been her and I for so long and to have this new baby, what's it going to do for her? And just thinking, maybe we're not ready for this, but it's too late. And I just had a really good cry and my husband was just amazing. He he kept saying, we've done this before, we're going to do it again and everything's going to be fine. So I think I just needed to have that release and like name those fears and allow myself to kind of let go of that. And I put headphones on and I had the gentle birth app, which was really helpful. It's just some hypnosis tracks that I started to listen to. And I allowed myself to really get back in the zone. And when we went to triage again, I just kept my headphones in. I covered my eyes with a blanket and I just laid there. The midwife got us right into the birthplace, which was awesome. As soon as we got in there, I just felt very comfortable. It was this great atmosphere. It was really quiet. We had this nice room with a lot of windows and it was a big space. It just felt really comfortable. As soon as I got in there, I was like, okay, this is going to happen and we're going to be all right. And at that point, everything had picked up again. So I think we got in around 5.30 p.m. 
And I spent a couple hours just lying in side lying release position, which the nurse did. It's a spinning babies technique. So she had all these pillows around me and I was just lying on my side. And with each contraction, Matt would do counter pressure on my back. And I was able to just lay there and rest for a couple hours until eventually I couldn't lay comfortably anymore. So I got up, I had a couple of contractions like on the toilet, bending over on the bed, but I started to feel like nothing was really helping give me comfort. So the nurse actually filled up the bathtub and thought that might help. So I got into the bathtub around 7.30 and that was amazing. It's just the warm water. My husband laughed because I was playing in there and I just kept like ladling water over my belly. And he's like, you just looked so comfortable and like you were gonna fall asleep. So it was so helpful. I laid in there for about an hour. And at about 8.30, I started to get really nervous because I was like, oh my gosh, I think my labor is stopping again. And I was like panicking, like, I can't believe this is going to happen again. I'm not really in labor. What was I thinking? So I got out of the tub and I was definitely, nothing was stalling. I was actually in transition. I think I just had a little bit of a break in between um, transition, which I've heard can happen. So I got out and I started shaking. I was like kind of dry heaving, thinking I was going to throw up. And I asked um, the nurse to check me. And so she came in and I hadn't been checked since I came in, I think, three hours before or so. And I was at like a three or four. So I was really happy when she checked me. She said I was at a nine and my bag of water was bulging. And I'd actually just even forgotten about the fact that my water had to break. It was not even on my radar. So she's like, I think as soon as your water breaks, you're going to be ready to push. And I got out of bed with a contraction and started going to the bathroom. I wanted to sit on the toilet, but I didn't even make it. I just like kind of collapsed on hands and knees and my water broke. I was like trying to throw up. I was gagging. And as my stomach muscles were contracting, I think it caused my water to just come out. And it was so weird. It was like this big water balloon just plopped on the ground and exploded. It was a really cool feeling. But I looked down at the water and I told my husband to get the nurse. He said, get the nurse and tell her my water broke and there's meconium in it. I could see green and brown. It made me a little nervous. And I said, and I'm pushing. And just instantly, my body just started pushing. I definitely experienced the fetal ejection reflex where your body just pushes for you and you don't have any control over it. So my husband got the nurse and the midwife. And when they came in, I was still on the floor on hands and knees pushing. They put me up on the bed and I had maybe three or four pushes. And each push just with the fetal ejection reflex was the craziest feeling ever because my body just did all the work. It was just, I describe it as a train going through me. There was just no stopping it. It was so powerful. And with each push, I was just screaming. And then in between pushes, I was totally lucid and I would just be like, what is happening? And at one point I go, am I dying? Am I okay? Which is funny because I wasn't scared. It was just so intense and so powerful that I just needed somebody to remind me that, yes, this is okay. My nurse just told me, you got to breathe. Everything's fine. So after three or four pushes, she was out and she was here. And so I came into the hospital around 530 and she was born at 853. So once it finally did start, I think once I let go and allowed it to happen, it was really fast. It was about three hours. After she was born, it was the coolest thing. They handed her to us and we looked out the window and there was this beautiful orange sunset and it was just the most serene, calm environment. It was it was just beautiful. I couldn't believe she was here. And I remember looking at her and thinking she looked so much like her big sister. It was so cool and it had that feeling too. I was like, I know you. I was so worried that I wouldn't love you or like you because you're not your sister, but here you are. And it's just so wild how all those fears just kind of melted away. 
Oh my gosh. Yes. I hear that all the time from second time moms. And I totally went through the same thing. Just it, it's hard to imagine your love and heart expanding more, but it definitely is possible and it happens at different rates for everyone. So I love that you had that immediate bond. And I also love the way that you explained your pushing phase. And I feel like I know I can relate and a lot of people too can where you're just like had that moment where you're like, oh my gosh, what is happening? I don't know if I can do this, but then you kind of bring it back down and you, and you do it. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, it sounds like you had that kind of immediate bonding and golden hour. How long did they have you stay with it being a birth center attached to a hospital? So because they're still attached to the hospital, they do have to follow like those hospital protocol. Okay. And my biggest thing being there, my husband and I, we had told them we want to be able to leave and go home as soon as possible. Like, please do everything you can to allow us to get home. We just wanted to be in our own space, but they do have to do some tests at 24 hours. So we did have to wait a full day, which was kind of hard, but at least we were in a really good space. Right after the birth, I remember I just felt on top of the world. It was so awesome. And after my first, it was just so different because after my first baby, like after kind of coming down from that like euphoria and high, I remember feeling really panicked, really, I don't know, just uncomfortable. I felt so nervous. They kept taking the baby to do the tests in the nursery or they would just take her and no one would really explain why they were taking her or what was happening. It just made me so uncomfortable. I had some like separation anxiety, I think. But this time being in the birthplace, everything was done in the room. So they never took her away. Any newborn testing or screening that they had to do, they did either on the bed or even with her on my chest or at least in the room where I was with her. So that was awesome. I was really, really grateful for that. And that was part of my planning. I knew I wanted an experience like that. I didn't want to have to have that experience again. So yeah, everything was done in the room, which was awesome. Our first night, she was so sleepy, but I was able to eat. I actually had an appetite and I felt so relaxed. I was able to sleep when she slept, which again, just total night and day from the first and second The first night she was so sleepy. I think she slept like four or five straight hours. We actually had to wake her up to nurse her. So it was great. The next day we hung out. I gave her her first bath. I felt so well that I was able to get up and take a shower and walk around. I had very minimal tearing. So physically I felt really, really well. And with my first, I had a third degree tear and I didn't even have anything to compare it to. So I didn't know what a challenge that was. But to be able to have this experience was awesome because I felt physically like I was just able to move around and hold her and walk around with her. I felt like sharing with people. Um, I was taking pictures. We called our family. It was just a very different experience to have had an experience where I felt only dread and panic to now this where I felt very relaxed and excited and wanted to to share the news with everybody. But the tough part was with COVID, we couldn't have her older sister visit in the hospital. So I missed my two-year-old at home so much. It was bittersweet to be there with our new baby and to not have Maya there with us. So right at 24-hour mark, we were just watching the clock, ready to go home. And our nurse, thankfully, really advocated for it, all the tests to be done as soon as possible, whereas I think other times they might have just suggested waiting until the morning. They were a little bit concerned. Her bilirubin levels were kind of high, but it was like right on the cusp of needing further treatment or anything. But we were able to go home, thankfully, that night. And I really am thankful our nurse was just, she got it. She's like, I know I have kids at home. I feel the same way. Uh, The other really cool thing about the birth center is we didn't have to move to a postpartum unit. We stayed in the same room the whole time. So the nurse who was there when she was born was back on shift the next evening. So it was great to see her again and kind of process through the whole birth. So yeah, we were able to go home the next night and the nurse walked us out. And I remember she broke all the COVID protocol and she gave me a big hug. And she was like, that's what birth should look like. That's so awesome. Like she was just so, so excited for us. Oh, that's amazing. It was so sweet. Always labor nurses are, they're just amazing. They don't get enough credit (laughs) and they do all the work. 
Well, mom does all the work, but they're there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, you know, I love hearing the sibling meat stories. So how was going yeah. home? Oh, going home was so sweet. I can't believe I was so nervous about, you know, what's this going to do for Maya? She's going to, she's going to hate us. It's going to be the worst. (laughs) But we went home and when Maya came to meet her, we had Callie, is my new baby's name, the new baby at the time. She was in a little bouncer seat and Maya walked in and she's like, can I see the baby? And she went over and she kissed her head and she said, I'm your big sister, Maya. And then we had told her that Callie was going to bring home something from the hospital. And she's like, where's my snack? <laughs> it was very food driven. <laughs> I want my so, treat. <laughs> yeah, so Aww. she gave her some fruit snacks and she'll still talk about that. She'll be like, do you remember when Callie came home from the hospital and gave me fruit snacks? <laughs> so it was sweet. Aww. Yeah, it was really, really sweet. And then like the transition from one to two went a lot better than I thought it would. There were definitely more ups and downs. And just those early weeks, it was so sweet being home with just the four of us. And again, COVID, we didn't have people over. We would occasionally meet our family outside. And it was June, so it was beautiful in New York. And because Callie's Billy room levels were high, we would spend some time outside in the sun each day anyway. So that was really good. And I do think that helped with her having a little bit of jaundice, uh, just a little bit of sunshine helped. Uh, The transition with Maya and Callie went mostly better than I thought. And it's funny in thinking about recording today, I was thinking about, you know, it was really sweet and Maya was so great. And then I actually started reading through some things that I had written during that time period And kind of forgot about some of the challenges of um, when I would be nursing Callie, her big sister would come over and pull her head off my boob. I'd be like, no, I don't think so, mom. (laughs) And there were definitely some episodes where she would poke her in the eye or say, I don't like baby Callie. I don't want her here. Oh, so it was a challenge. Definitely. There was one day that this sounds worse than it was somehow. But Maya came over and actually hit her over the head with a plastic guitar. And my husband and I were just shocked. We're like, Maya, why would you do that? And she looked at us and goes, I like to hurt her. I want to make baby Kelly cry. We're like, well, these are some psychopath vibes here. What's going on? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we were definitely thrown for a loop there. But so hard. And I'm sure you came to realize very normal. (laughs) Yes. So after that little incident, I think there were like a few weeks where it just got really hard for her. And in the middle of the night, I would have Callie, you know, she'd be nursing and Matt would be in bed with Maya just trying to comfort her because she'd be like, I want my mama. So I felt a lot of guilt about just not being able to be there for her as much. And I was surprised too. I felt a lot of guilt because I was like, this new baby is never just going to have time where it's just her and I, and my older daughter got to have that, but it definitely got easier. And now I look at them playing and they are just, I mean, they're so funny together. They just play and love each other and they're so sweet. And it was, you know, ups and downs, but definitely aside from the, the guitar incident, I would say there were a lot, a lot more ups and downs and a lot of moments where Maya would sing to her and read books to her and say, don't cry, baby Callie. And it's just so sweet to think about their littleness at that time. It's been a couple of years. Yeah. So for people who are listening that have a newborn and a toddler, do you remember at what age it kind of like got a little bit easier as far as them playing together and everything? I think after a few months when Callie would really be interested in watching her big sister and she'd Mm -hmm. look at her and smile and interact more, that got easier. And when she wasn't needing to be held or needing to be nursed all the time. So I think, yeah, I mean, those first, the first month or two was really hard. And after that, it it got easier. And then it just becomes your normal, you know? Right. And we found ways for Matt to really spend quality time with Maya. And then at least once a day, I would make sure that Matt held the baby and I would have time with Maya alone. So that was really helpful. Yeah. I always try to tell people that 
it seems like it was my experience and from people I talked to that like when the baby starts kind of sitting up on their own or at least being Mm -hmm. able to be sat up in a, you know, some kind of device, that's when they can really feel like they're playing with them. And once that toddler gets their first laugh out of the baby, it's like uh, addictive, I feel like. And they just want to make them laugh all the time, which is super sweet. Yes. And Maya wanted to help a lot. She'd want to bring over diapers. Um, She still is a little helper with her. So it was sweet watching that and seeing her enjoy that. And we always had told her, you're welcome to help, but it's not your job. You don't need to help. Your job is to just be a fun big sister and to play with her when you want to. Mm -hmm. So we tried to just be cool about, you know, she's here, but you know, it's not your job to to help make her stop crying or things like that. Yeah, I remember having somebody come on that shared about like packing a toddler diaper bag, like for them to bring with them out and about too, so they could like hand a pacifier or whatever and feel like they were helping, which I thought was a really smart idea. That's sweet. (laughs) I can't remember where I read it or saw a video, which has always stuck with me though, about bringing a new baby home. It compared it to if your husband was telling you for months, listen, I'm going to bring this new woman home and she's going to be beautiful and you're going to love her and we're going to spend time with her. And I know it's going to be hard, but you're just going to love her so much. And yeah. <laughs> and we're going to give her all the things you've grown out of. Yeah. But she's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that too. It was from a parenting course that I took and I think it was reading from something. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that always stuck with me to just try to be aware of, you know what, this is going to be really, really hard for her, but it's normal. And at the end of the day, they're both so lucky to have each other. And it was such a good relationship. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. And what about your mental health this time? Oh, yeah. I cannot even believe um, after experiencing such a tough postpartum with the first, it was like we spent weeks waiting for the other shoe to drop. My husband every day would be like, how do you feel? Do you feel like crying? Are you sad? are you still eating? Can you sleep? And I was like, you need to stop asking me. I feel so good. I remember one day I was making pancakes with Maya and Callie was just laying quietly on her little bouncer as happy as can be. And I was just thinking, I cannot believe how good this feels. I just felt, I felt happy. I felt the whole experience was just I couldn't have imagined it being better. I was at least anticipating, um, you know, some baby blues and I didn't, I felt amazing, which it was just such a stark contrast between the first and the second. And I'm so glad that I got to experience this time around, like really being able to just be present in the moment and know what it's like to just hold a baby and to feel happy and to just take in her littleness. I feel like with my first I feel like postpartum depression kind of robbed me of those first few months where I can't even remember what it was like to really hold her. And people will talk about like the newborn smell or the snuggles. Like all I remember is just feeling really sad and just having this like dreaded feeling and not being able to sleep, not being able to eat. And this time around was the total opposite. I was like a bottomless pit. I wanted to eat. I wanted to sit out in the sun and I wanted to talk to people. I wanted to take pictures. I wanted to just share, you know, everything with family and friends. And it was just the complete opposite of the first and the second. And I feel like if I didn't experience that the first time, I would have had no idea how good I had it this time around. But I was just so grateful great. That's awesome. Was the Zoloft something that you continued for quite a while or or were you tapering off? What was your plan with that? No, yeah, because because I felt so well, I really, I wonder if I even needed it. I don't know, but I I don't regret taking it by any means. But I think around three months, I started to try to taper off and see how it felt. And anytime I went down a dose, I felt fine. And so I think somewhere between three and six months, I ended up going off of it and didn't have any issues at all. So that was fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Especially with like different hormonal fluctuations and everything that come Mm -hmm. with postpartum and breastfeeding and all that. Yeah. Well, and I really think too, like this time around, just having a birth that went so well and having the... I think just knowing what to expect, you know, nothing can prepare you like the wisdom of just, I've done this before. I know somewhat what to expect. Of course, it's always different with each baby, but knowing how to handle sleep deprivation, 
and knowing that, you know, we're not going to sleep, that it's normal for this baby to need me 24 seven. And it's only going to last a short season and a few months, it's going to get easier. And a few months after that, it'll get easier. So it was really just, I think, knowing what to expect. And also this time around, not really worrying about following expectations that we kind of put on ourselves. Like, oh, you have to put the baby down so they can learn how to sleep. And this time it was, I didn't feel bad about, I'm just going to hold her as much as I want. And we're going to kind of set ourselves up to allow me to sleep and her to sleep. We took the crib and we took a side off and attached it to the bed. So it was like a little sidecar. And I wish I had known to do that with my first because it felt like she was in the bed with me, but she also had her own space. So I I felt comfortable with that, but I could, you know, just reach my hand over and, you know, the new mom got to check that you're breathing every hour. So she was right there. I could easily bring her in bed to nurse with me. And the other thing too, with my first, I remember being so scared of falling asleep with her or having her in bed with me that I never actually slept. I just would stay awake, just being scared and anxious all the time. And I remember when my first, when she would wake up to nurse, I would take her downstairs and I'd like watch TV while I nursed her and try to stay awake. But of course you're exhausted. So there were definitely times where I would fall asleep on the couch and then wake up in a panic because I had her with me. And this time around, I actually took the time to read through the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, safe sleep recommendations and also did a, a lot of research about like safe bed sharing and the way to really set yourself up to make sure that you're being safe, but also allowing mom to get some rest. So now I know that bringing your baby onto a couch or a recliner is so much less safe than if you bring them in bed with you and set your bed up, even if you don't think you're going to sleep in bed with your baby, to set your bed up in a safe way. And there's a lot of resources out there that you can read about, you know, not having loose blankets, especially if you're breastfeeding, if you're not drinking alcohol, like it's a lot more safe to have her in bed with you than it is in other situations. So I think loosening up on on that fear of, I think in the first time it was like, I had so much fear around SIDS or rolling over on her that it, it made it so like I could just never sleep. And this time around, I felt so much more prepared for how we were going to handle sleep. And a lot of times, you know, I would fall asleep with her in bed with me and still right now have a two and four year old in my bed. So, but this time I just felt so much more relaxed about it. And I think that helped a lot. So everybody was able to get some sleep. Yeah. It's such a good point about the bed sharing and Mm -hmm. when the sleeping on the couch thing comes up in like our Facebook group and stuff, it's like the one thing where I just feel compelled to chime in as far as like, please don't do that because yeah, it's really, really not the best idea and there's safe ways to get sleep together. So absolutely. Yeah. The only other thing, so the other huge part of my postpartum, I mean, overall, everything went great emotionally, physically. I couldn't have asked for a better postpartum, but we did end up, of course, she had to throw us a little bit of a curveball because I feel like you always have to have something that you struggle with. And I hope in sharing this, that maybe I can help somebody else. Callie ended up She went seven months with an undiagnosed tongue tie that just completely affected her weight gain, the way breastfeeding was going. And I look back on that time and I cannot believe we missed so much of that. When she was born, she was born in the 50th percentile for weight. And then by two months, she had dropped down to the 25th percentile. And then at four months, she dropped down to the 10th percentile. So we knew she was definitely not gaining as well as we anticipated. And in my gut, I knew something was off with that because my first always was like, she maintained her birth weight. She was in the 90th percentile across the board, still is. So I I was like, something's just off. And at the same time, I was having a lot of breastfeeding difficulties, which I never had with my first. That was like the one thing that went super well. And In her first couple months, we kept noticing on her tongue, she had like a lot of white and then sometimes yellow, like this big film on her tongue. And so our pediatrician, he diagnosed her with thrush. And now I know she didn't actually have thrush. What was happening is because she had a tongue tie, she wasn't able to rub her tongue on the roof of her mouth. 
So the milk was just building up, building up. So our pediatrician treated her on and off for a couple months for thrush. So she was taking an antifungal. I'm taking an antifungal. But we were thinking, okay, these first couple months, thrush kind of explains why maybe she's not gaining weight as well. Maybe she's uncomfortable. I thought it was also explaining why I was having like nipple pain. But then after that, you know, she kept having this film and I just stopped treating her for thrush because I wasn't really convinced that's what she had. I, you know, it just seemed weird that we would be treating her for so long with no, you know, she wasn't getting better. So I did see an IBCLC, a lactation consultant, and she looked at Callie and she watched us feed and she thought, you know, everything looked fine. She did a weighted feed. And even though she wasn't transferring a lot, I remember her saying, you know, I think she's just who she is. She's just a small petite baby and I don't really see any issues. She's very happy. She's meeting her developmental milestones. So we kind of let it go. And then at six months, she ended up by then she dropped to the zero percentile. She wasn't even on the growth chart for weight. And at six months when that happened, our pediatrician started having us come in week to week to do weight checks. And at that point, she just stopped gaining weight. And so she was actually diagnosed as failure to thrive, which was really, really hard to hear that. And at the same time, we started introducing solids. And then I was noticing she couldn't eat food. She was gagging. Anytime she tried to swallow food, she'd actually throw up. She'd kind of put food in her cheeks and wouldn't actually swallow it. So then my pediatrician was assuming this was some sort of GI issue. So we were on a wait list to see a GI doctor. But I ended up going back to my um, IBCLC. And I just wanted to see if she had recommendations on where to go from here because I really didn't think it was a GI issue. And she said, this sounds like maybe she has a tongue tie. And she said, you know, I looked at her mouth when I saw her. I didn't think I saw anything, but I think maybe you should get a second opinion. And she also told me about seeing an infant feeding specialist, which I didn't even know was a thing. (laughs) And all this time, my pediatrician just kept suggesting that maybe it's me, maybe I'm not making enough milk, maybe I have low supply, we should just give her a bottle. And we actually, I tried to give her bottles and I would tell him anytime I try to give her a bottle or have her sip from a cup, she'll gag if she won't take anything. So he was super unhelpful. Um, But finally, at between six and seven months, we did get her assessed from a pediatric dentist and she did have a posterior tongue tie. And we went in for an appointment a few days after I called them. It was a five minute procedure. They do a laser to correct it. We were in and out that day. And that night, I remember her nursing and it just felt different immediately. And I cannot believe it took us seven months to get there. And I thought, how did a midwife, my pediatrician, a lactation consultant, look in her mouth and no one, no one knew. And it wasn't even on my radar because I thought it would be really obvious. Oh my gosh, yeah. When we got it done, from one week to the next, she actually gained four ounces. She went from gaining nothing in a month to four ounces in a week. And so it was just mind blowing to me that, that... we had allowed this to happen for so long. And I remember feeling really guilty thinking, how did I not know? Because I knew instinctively when her percentiles were dropping, I knew it wasn't right. So that was a really big challenge. And it ended up leading into her having pretty significant issues with food, introducing her to solids. But we went to our GI doctor who was amazing. I remember going to him just feeling horrible thinking I starved my baby for seven months. What the heck? But at having that failure to thrive diagnosis, I just felt horrible. And I remember him just saying, you know, that diagnosis doesn't mean anything. Look at her. She's healthy. She has these little tiny fat rolls on her little tiny thighs. You're not starving her. She's fine. And he's like, I really do think you, obviously you found the problem with the tongue tie and you do not need to be with me. He connected us to an infant feeding specialist. So uh, a speech pathologist who specializes in, in feeding, which was really cool. We actually ended up going to two different ones before we found a really good fit. But then we found a great fit. We found an occupational therapist who does it locally. 
And so week to week, we would have Zoom calls where she would watch Callie eat and she gave me a bunch of different tools to use to try to develop the muscles in her mouth so that she could actually relearn how to use her tongue. And she kind of gave me the analogy. She's like, it's like if you've been wandering around with your shoelaces tied together your whole life and then somebody unties them and you're able, you know, you previously you were able to shuffle your feet enough to walk but now you have to learn how to walk in these big steps. And so we essentially had to teach Callie how to use her mouth and how to get food to the back of her mouth with her tongue. And I don't remember if it was her. One of my providers had told me having a tongue tie, it's not about sticking your tongue out. She said, it's like trying to swallow. And I did this and you, anybody listening should do it because it's kind of cool. If you try to swallow and when you're trying to swallow, don't move your tongue to the roof of your mouth. You will be able to do it, but you will gag and it'll feel really uncomfortable. And that's how she was eating. or That's how she was drinking for seven months. And it's just kind of wild to think about, you know, she was able to adapt enough, but obviously it affected her weight gain over that time. And now she's two years old and I, we are just getting to the point where she's really, really eating. And it's it's pretty awesome to see the change, but it has taken a long time. And because of that misdiagnosis for so long or the undiagnosis for so long, it, it really affected her whole mouth. So I always try to share that with people. And I just, I always think about how many people have gone through that or we're just told like, well, maybe you're just not meant to breastfeed or maybe your baby has reflux and needs medication. Um, I just think if I never found those resources, if I never reached back out to a, a lactation consultant and went to the dentist, I wonder how long it would have taken for us to really find that issue. It's just, it's frustrating to look back on. But at the same time, I'm really, really glad that I did learn about that. Yeah. It sounds like you really did a lot of advocating for her. And I'm sure it was like, like you said, the breastfeeding was not an issue with your first. So it's even harder to kind of wrap your head around it being something like that when you have successfully nursed, you know, you were able to nurse her too. And so it was just a weird thing. Yeah. And I always thought like, I mean, I'd obviously heard about tongue tie, but I thought it would be a really obvious thing that anyone could really look in your mouth and see, but it's really not the case. But I do remember my lactation consultant was very, she was great about it because she said, you know, she's like, you've really taught me that I need to be able to assess for this better. And she said for her, she's like, this was a really big learning lesson for me because she truly had told me, oh, this, you know, I don't see an issue. It's fine. She's just little. Um, so she and I have actually stayed in touch over the years. And she's she's actually had some women that she works with reach out to me and kind of share stories. And so it's been cool. And because of that, I actually ended up working with her. She runs our local, it's called the Breastfeeding Cafe. So it's like our local La Leche League. And so I ended up getting more involved with that. Something I really wish I had done earlier because I think it would have been super helpful. Uh, But I actually ended up taking a course to become a certified lactation consultant. So I did that last year. I don't know what I'll do with it in the future, but definitely something cool to be able to like volunteer locally and, and help moms going through similar stuff. So you know, it's, I think people should know too, there's a huge difference between a CLC, which I got to be, which I am, and an IBCLC. So if you are needing help to reach out to an IBCLC, somebody who has major credentials, tons of education, tons of hours of experience. So I think sometimes people just, you know, they don't realize what a difference there is. And also that your insurance, at least in New York state, should cover visits with an IBCLC. Right. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, of course. All right. Anything else? Any any other parts of your story you want to share or do you want to go ahead and share some resources? No, I think I covered everything. I would say resources, like I said, having an IBCLC set up ahead of time and even just connecting with like, if you have a La Leche League, if you are interested in breastfeeding, to know those resources ahead of time. And that an IBCLC isn't just somebody who you might need for breastfeeding support, but they tend to be the people who know other providers in the community. So they might know things like I had no idea infant feeding 
specialists were a thing. And it was an awesome resource for us to have. And I wouldn't have known that without reaching out to my lactation consultant. So that's a huge resource for me. It's just, I guess, just knowing like what's available in your community. Other resources I loved, I really, really liked the podcast all about breastfeeding. And if anyone else is especially interested in learning about tongue tie, I've kind of become obsessed with (laughs) researching it now. Um, They have a really awesome series about tongue tie that explains so much. And I think it just came out like a year ago. And I so wished that it had come out sooner and that I had listened to it because I can't believe all the, the symptoms that I missed. Another podcast that I've recently fallen in love with is called Tales from the Fourth Trimester. So if anybody else enjoys hearing postpartum stories, the host is a doula in Australia. So she has some really great people come on and they cover some good topics. And I really, really love that podcast. And then I also really liked, I think it's been mentioned before on here, but the Beyond Sleep Training Project It's just a resource for people who I think sometimes when you just decide to not sleep train and you decide, "Ah, I'm just going to kind of follow my baby's cues and, and hold them. And I don't know, for me, like I said, in my first, I felt so much pressure to like get my baby to sleep and do things by the book. And this time just letting go was huge for me. And then finding that resource to know I'm not alone in that was really, really helpful. And then I always would want to mention that being in the birth hour Patreon group on Facebook is hands down my favorite resource. Oh my goodness. Love it. I I mean, two years and four years out from birth and I still post in there all the time, like looking for even toddler recommendations. And I love reading through the posts and, and commenting on that. And it's just such a good group. And I'm not usually, I'm not ever, I never thought I would be somebody who would like post in a Facebook group and kind of be on that platform in that way. But everybody there is just so helpful and it's just such a good group. And I I highly recommend that anybody who's not a member to definitely join that. Well, thanks for saying that. Yeah, I totally agree. It's the only group that and our childbirth course group are the only groups I'm really (laughs) active in or even on Facebook for because they're just so great. Yes, it's actually, I was going to delete my Facebook because it gives me high blood pressure, I think. But I'm like, I can't, (laughs) I have to go in there for that group. I love it. Yeah, I just go straight for the notifications and see if there's stuff in the group, but I go there. I don't even go to the newsfeed anymore. (laughs) Yep, totally agree. All right, and then where's the best place for people to reach out to you? So I am in the Facebook group. Right. (laughs) I'm Britt Watkins on Facebook. And then otherwise, if anybody wants to just leave a message on the show notes, I'll definitely see it. Okay. Yeah, I'm not super active, but yeah, you can definitely find me in the Facebook group or there. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming back and sharing this second story with us. Thank you so much. It was really fun to think back on that time again. Okay, now I'm going to talk to Shelby about the Ergo Baby Bouncer, as well as some of her favorite baby carriers from Ergo Baby. Hi, Shelby. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Ergo Baby. Hi, Bryn. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, before we get into our conversation about Ergo Baby, can you tell listeners just a little bit about you and your family? Sure. Uh, my name's Shelby. I live just outside of Portland, Maine. I'm a maternal fetal medicine stenographer. I have two kiddos, a two and a half year old boy and a three month old little girl. Okay. So I feel like you're right in those ages where any kind of device that can be helpful is welcomed. So let's start by talking a little bit about your experience with baby wearing and how that's impacted your your motherhood and postpartum journey. Um, with my first baby, I used a wrap a lot in the first couple of weeks and I liked it. It was just kind of hard to maneuver and it was like kind of hot also to wear. I was kind of sweating in it a lot. Um, and I tried to use the I also had the Ergo 360 that I tried to use, but it had the infant insert and I just couldn't figure it out until he was a little bit older. So when he was a little bit older, we used the Ergo 360 all the way until he was 18 months old, probably used it every single day. Nice. Yeah. The infant insert was tricky for me too with my first baby. I think we kind of just gave up and then now they have all these ones with the built-in ability to go from young ages all the way up to toddlers. So people don't have to worry about that as much, but yeah, I I can, I can feel you on that one. (laughs) Yeah. It was just a little too complicated for me, but 
this uh, this most recent time, I think I heard about it on your podcast, the Ergo Embrace I went ahead and bought because my due date was in July. So I was like, it's going to be hot. Maybe mm-hmm. I'll try something a little cooler. And it has been awesome. I use it every single day with her. And I was able to use it. I think we started using it like two weeks postpartum. And it's really easy to use. My husband can use it really well he never he would never try a wrap so this is this one has been really nice for him to use as well yeah it kind of has that feel of a wrap but with the ease of just being able to buckle it on and go which is really nice yeah it's really cozy she loves it it's the only place she naps during the day so I use it a lot (laughs) yeah you've got a a baby wearing napper I can relate to that as well oh yeah (laughs) So did you get the the cool air mesh one with it being a summer baby? Yep, yep. So it was really nice. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. I feel like that's nice even for in the winter when you have your heater on and you're doing those indoor naps. You don't want to be sweating on each other too much. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I feel, I feel like especially postpartum, I'm always kind of sweaty anyway. So it's been really nice yes. to have it. Awesome. Okay. And so I know you also recently got to try out the Ergo Baby Bouncer, which is their newest product. So tell us how you've incorporated that into your, your life. Yeah. Yeah. It's been super nice because we're, you know, we're also potty training right now. So, so just having a a space for her to be that I can put her down and have her safe and comfortable has been really helpful. I, I really like it because it's, it's really supportive. It like supports her head and her neck and her hips really well. She just looks really comfy in it. Yeah. I love that Ergo Baby, that's like their whole thing, right? The Ergo part of Ergo Baby is ergonomics. And so they're really focused on making sure you're not just yes. strapping them into something, but that they're going to be sitting in it in a way that's good for them and comfortable. And are, is she still small enough that you're using that little newborn cushion in it? Um, I actually just took that out to try out to see what it would be like without it and both ways look really comfortable so the with the newborn insert it just looks I don't know even more cushioned and supportive but she's also really supported without the cushion in there too yeah I feel like that little cushion's probably best for when like the head support is needing a little bit extra but yeah how old is she now again you said a few months right three months old yeah so she's just starting okay. to like lift her head and really try, want to yeah. look around and stuff, so. <laughs> that's awesome but I like this bouncer so much more than my other bouncer because she, in my other bouncer, she'll sl- like slide down and hunch, hunch over. And like, I'm always having to adjust her and like push her back up into it. So with this one, I don't have to adjust her at all. She just stays put and she looks really comfy. That's awesome. Yeah. And they're really, really cute too. They're just kind of like fit in with your decor without being, you know, a bunch of little characters or something like that. Yeah, I know. It's really visually appealing too. <laughs> well, I know you said you had a toddler and these bouncers go up to um, 30 pounds. They can use it as a little TV set, but you said your your kiddo's just a little bit out of the weight range. <laughs> I know. I think the weight range says up to 29 pounds okay, 20. and he's just now 30 pounds. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't tried it on him, but I think it's probably better too because he's he's really obsessed with all all the baby things. Oh my so gosh! Trying to keep it separate. Totally <laughs> get that. Anyway. Yeah, I remember my older kids were like getting into the extra saucer and stuff, like just oh, thinking yeah. it was hilarious. Um, but yeah, I love that it could be a little like seat for them in front of the coffee table or or the TV or something for a little yeah. bit when they're older, and it doesn't take up a ton of room like some of those big like armchairs that they make for toddlers um, that our grandparents oh, yeah. bought our kids. And now I'm like, where am I supposed to put this? <laughs> yeah. No, it fits in really well to the regular living room space yeah. for sure. I'm excited to see how it works as she gets bigger. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like it's, um, it has like a really strong base on it too. So that with older Mm -hmm. kids around, you don't have to, or even like a dog, you don't have to worry about it getting knocked over or something. That was always my concern. Oh yeah. Yes. And he'll go over and he'll like lean on it and push, you know, kind of bounce her while she's in it. And it, it seems really sturdy. It hasn't tipped over anything. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm such a big fan of these types of things because 
like we all know you don't need a whole lot with a newborn, right? Like you, you just need to be able mm-hmm. to have a safe place for them to sleep and, and a way to feed them. But it's so nice to have some of these just extra conveniences. Like for me, I just loved having a safe oh, spot yeah. to put the baby in the bathroom so I could take a shower or even just pee, you know, especially if you don't want to have, you know, be baby wearing in that moment. So yeah, I'm glad that Ergo Baby is kind yeah. of added this to their rotation of things helping life be a little bit easier with babies. <laughs> For sure. I would not be able to get ready in the morning right now without it. So it's very helpful. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience with me about it. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad that the bouncer's working out and that baby wearing has been a big part of your life as well. Yeah. Thanks for talking with me, Bryn. Thanks again to Britt for sharing her story with us and to Ergo Baby for sponsoring this episode. If you want more information from today's episode, including leaving comments for Britt, you can do that on the show notes page by heading over to thebirthhour.com and searching for her name in the search bar. And if you want to become a Patreon member, I figured I'd just share that link again here at the end since Britt just talked about it. And that link is patreon.com slash birthhour. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.